Hi, everyone. Uh, this week, we are reading part one of Stephen Shapin's The Scientific Revolution. And I just want to give you a little bit of some of the intellectual background from which this book emerges. And some of it I've already uh, discussed in class. So I mentioned that at some point in the 1960s, late 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, there starts to be this debate among historians and philosophers of science about how do we make sense of science historically. And uh, the question gets answered in two ways. There is what is sometimes known as the internalist answer, and then later the externalist answer. So there is a bit this debate between internalist or uh, internalism and externalism. Now, what do those terms mean? Uh, in very simple terms, internalists, uh, most of whom were scientists, practice, uh, practicing scientists, made the argument that if you want to understand the historical development of science, see where scientific knowledge came from, how it unfolded, and potentially even where it's going, like in the future, making predictions about where science is heading, you just do an internal analysis, uh, which means you only look at factors internal to science itself. You don't look at anything else in society. And so the internalist account basically says, just look at the internal logic of scientific practice and scientific research in order to understand the historical unfolding of science. So what does that look like in practice? Well, you start asking scientific questions about science, like what were the theories? What were the observations that functioned as evidence for those theories? Were those observations acquired using valid um, or reliable methods of observation, uh, reliable tools and techniques like telescopes, microscopes, etc.? And uh, you never go outside of what is considered scientific. So you just restrict yourself um, to thinking, as it were, scientifically about science. Now, this view, the internalist view of science, really foregrounds questions of the rationality of sciences, the objectivity of the data, the reliability of scientific testimony, and things like that. But then a number of people, um, among them uh, Thomas Kuhn, um, among them Stephen Shapin, who wrote this book a little bit later in the mid-1990s, so he's coming at the end of that debate, um, as well as many other figures. Um, Stephen Shapin, by the way, is uh, uh, coming out of a British, uh, he's, an, he's, he's writing in England. Um, so these figures start saying, you know, I'm not so sure about this internalist approach to the history of science, because it seems as if the only way you can really understand the historical evolution of science is by looking at extra scientific factors. You have to look at the subjective preferences and interests of the scientists. You have to look at material relations um, in society, it's almost like a Marxist approach where you look at economics. You have to look at politics. You have to look at philosophy and theology because all of these other things provide the social and conceptual framework in which science unfolds. And so there is this debate in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s between internalism and externalism, and uh, Stephen Shapin is definitely on the externalist side of that debate. And so what he's going to do in this book is he's going to look at the scientific revolution of, this, of the uh, 17th century and make the argument that only an externalist account can really illuminate it. And the book, as, I, as you can see from the table of contents, is divided into three sections. And the first part that we're reading for this week is called What Was Known. So the, the key word being uh, what, focus on content. And so what he's going to do in this uh, part, in this chapter, is he's going to look at the observations that were available to scientists in the 17th century and that were used to a large extent to create a new worldview, a new cosmos, a new interpretation of the cosmos. And so, for example, let me share a screen so you can see, um, the, and this is in the reading. So if you look, here is the book. Uh, this is what you will be reading. If you look at page 17, right off the back, 
he gives us, for example, this picture, uh, this illustration, which is from 1612, so at the very beginning of the 17th century. And this is a description, a visual representation of what Galileo Galilei saw when he pointed his telescope uh, to the sun. So Galileo Galilei looks at the sun and realizes that there are these kind of sunspots, these blemishes. He didn't know what they were. He just realized that they're kind of like imperfections on the surface where it's a little darker than the rest of the sun. That's all he saw. But that counted, of course, as a scientific observation using a telescope. Now, the significance of this observation is very difficult to overestimate um, because it really was revolutionary. And to understand the revolutionary power of this observation, we have to look a little bit back to the cosmology, to the worldview that was in place before Galileo and before Copernicus, which is the worldview of the ancient Greeks, which dominated for 2,000 years. So according to the Greeks, and I'll, I'll be coming back to this image in a second, the world, and well, not the world, the universe, is divided into two realms. There's the Earth with its atmosphere. That's the terrestrial realm, and that's at the center of the universe. And this terrestrial realm is the realm of change, imperfection, um, of becoming rather than being, so change over stability. It's the place where there is nothing that is static nothing that is eternal, nothing that is permanent. Everything is always changing and, um, and turning into what it is not. So you have the Earth with its atmosphere, that's the, that's the terrestrial realm. And then beyond that, you have this gigantic sphere called the celestial sphere that contains the stars and the planets and everything else that is not the Earth. Now, according to the Greeks, one big difference between the, the terrestrial sphere and the celestial sphere is that the celestial sphere, which is the sphere of the celestial bodies, is perfect, right? So the celestial bodies, according to them, were almost divine, not in a Christian sense, because the Greeks are before the rise of Christianity, but it did have this transcendental, this transcendental, sorry, uh, this transcendental quality where the celestial bodies, like the other planets and the stars, they are perfect. There's a kind of uh, veneration of celestial bodies. And when they said they were perfect, what they meant is that these bodies are uniform, they never change, and they are incorruptible. Now, by the time Galileo points his telescope to the sun and uh, um, realizes that there are these blemishes. In fact, the sun is not, it's not smooth. It's not perfect. It's actually quite imperfect. What are these gaps? Either they're gaps, in which case it's not perfect, or they're blemishes, in which case it's also not perfect. Whatever they are, it's clear that the sun is not perfect. And so this became an important observation for bringing about, for it, it precipitated a new way of thinking about the universe. And so Stephen Shapin looks at this particular observation and several others as a way of drawing our attention to the way in which in the 17th century, and this is, again, this is just one example of many other observations, there is a fundamental upheaval in our understanding of the cosmos. So we go from having a universe where the earth is at the center and everything else around it is perfect to suddenly a new post-Copernican, post-Galilean world in which the earth is no longer at the center. And more importantly, this is something that is typically um, overlooked in, a lot, in some accounts of the history of science. The distinction between the terrestrial and the celestial is no longer sustainable because what is true of our terrestrial realm, imperfection, change, flaws, is also true of the celestial realm. And that means that this, the universe is just one and the same all over the place. There is no fundamental break between these two spheres.
which the Greeks believed there was. They, they believed there was a fundamental difference. So for the Greeks, the laws that apply, the physical laws that apply on earth just don't apply to the heavens. They are two different worlds. Um, and so Galileo says, no, they have to be unified. And so we need a unified physics for the terrestrial and the celestial realms. Now, all of these observations, and again, this is just one of them, all of these observations that are being uh, recorded and used in the 17th century, they contribute to the formation of a new worldview. Um, a worldview which, especially with Galileo, but even more so with figures after Galileo, like um, Isaac Newton, starts to be understood in an almost mathematical way. So there is suddenly a pressure to think about the world mathematically, objectively, um, and a lot of phenomena start being mathematized. So this is the moment when the mathematization of nature occurs, which is the idea that everything in nature can be subjected to quantitative analysis. You can measure it, you can cut it, you can take it apart, you can put it back together, and it's still the same thing. Um, and so this mathematical spirit becomes part of the very essence of science in the 17th century. Now, Stephen Shapin says, how do we understand this push for mathematization? Why did it take over? And he talks about what he calls the clock metaphor. Now, let me stop this share. He talks about the clock metaphor. And I assume many of you have seen this other um, image, which is a um, mechanical duck. It's very famous. Um, but Stephen Shapin says, in the 17th century, what really drove the scientific revolution was not just these empirical observations like Galileo's description of the spots on the sun, but it's rather this unconscious and sometimes even conscious metaphor that was dominant at the time, which is that nature is like a clock. Everything in the world operates like a clock. And so you see this, for example, with, um, in this case, with this duck, um, in theories about animal behavior, you see it in descriptions of plants, you see it in descriptions of human behavior, uh, you see it definitely in the study of, of physical objects, for sure. So the entire realm of the natural, uh, the entire natural realm is seen as this mechanical contraption that works almost like a clock. And when you think about a clock, what are the main things in a clock? Well, there's a bunch of little pieces, kind of cogs that like, you know, one cog turns and it turns another one and that's how it tells time. And if you're a scientist and you want to understand a clock, you have to do two things. One, you have to identify all the moving pieces, all the separate parts. So you have to disassemble the clock to identify all the parts. And then you have to understand how the parts interact with one another in order to bring about the emergent behavior of the whole clock. So there are those two steps. There is the reduction of the whole to its parts. And secondarily, there's that demand that all you have to do is explain how the parts interact and then you're done. That's what it means to think scientifically in 17th century. Now, this clock metaphor, according to Shapin, and he writes a lot about this clock metaphor and think about the fact that it's a metaphor, right? It, it, we, we act as if science is a clock, but maybe science, I'm sorry, as if nature is a clock, but may, maybe it isn't, but we behave as if it were. He says, this clock metaphor, and metaphors are not scientific, right? By definition, they're, if anything, they're literary, um, is what drives the scientific revolution. And so if you want to understand what's happening at this time, you have to think about these background assumptions, like the metaphors that people are using to make sense of the world. And the point about this metaphor is that it really led to the rise of, on the one hand, physical atomism, the idea that in the, the world is made up of atoms. You know, those are the little cogs of the machine. Those are the little pieces. And secondarily, that you can explain everything by just interacting by, by seeing how those pieces interact. 
And when I say everything, you know, I can imagine some of you saying, well, but that is the world, right? The world is made up of atoms. We, we learned that in physics and uh, there's no going around that. And that's true. But think about the second part here, which is the assumption that all you have to do to understand something is break it down into physical atoms and then give an account of how those atoms interact. Can we explain animal behavior in that way? Can we even understand the organic development of a flower with a purely physical account without a biological one? You know, just, just break it down as if it were only matter. Can we understand human behavior? You know, can we understand human mental states, human emotional states by talking in the language of physics? I don't know. And yet in the 17th century, there was this sense that that might be true that if you want to understand something, you have to go to that level of explanation. Now, very quickly, of course, people realize that there are a lot of benefits to this framework, to this atomistic, mechanical, or mechanistic framework of the 17th century, but there are also some limits. And so quickly people realize that this clock metaphor starts maybe leading us in the wrong direction in some cases. You know, I mean, now we, we might look at this and say, mm, well, that might not be where we want our biology to go. Uh, but if so, why is that? What's the limit? What's the problem with thinking about the living, living animals mechanically? Um, and so this is what's happening. This is just a way of talking to you about what to expect in part one. He's talking about this set of observations that lead to a revolution in our understanding of the world and our place in the universe as human beings. But he's also trying to draw our attention to the ways in which there are these non-scientific elements that determine how those observations are themselves interpreted. So yes, you can see the sunspots. Nobody denies that they're there. But then what do they mean? The answer that we give to that might be influenced by non-scientific factors, such as these background unconscious metaphors that are not scientific, but that are cultural, that are philosophical, that might be religious, you know, that, that come from other sources. And so as you read this chapter, just pay attention to what he says about those things and also try to keep track of the, of the what that he's talking about, what was known. So what were the things that caused the scientific revolution? After this, we will move on to part two, where he will talk about how things were known. Um, and uh, I'll make a different video about that.